that hymn that we just sang is an appropriate prayer for our sermon time. So join me as we pray, and I'm going to pray that last verse one more time. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us, Father, to grasp the heights of your plans for us today. Speak, O Lord, until we, your church, are built and the earth is filled with your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I got a, a really cool text from one of our church members last week. I'm not going to tell you who it was from. You're going to have to figure that one out through the grapevine. But I will tell you that it was from someone, and I hope this wouldn't offend this dear sister, who is one of our senior adults. Okay? That, that's somewhat relevant to this point today. The text said this. My daughter and I are going skydiving. Pray for two crazy women, please. Some of y'all might know who sent that. They're here this morning. Well, I responded by text and said, that is incredible. Have a blast. I want to see the video. For the record, I've seen the video, and it really was incredible. The best part for me was really seeing someone that I love embracing her life and living it to the full. Uh, we talked about in this, this, this song that we sang, it mentions uh, our prayer being the Lord will speak and build us up till the earth is filled with his glory. Do you think people that live life abundantly glorify God? I do. This message today may not seem extremely spiritual, but it really is. It's important. Um, during this particular pandemic season, I think, especially with all of the fears and uh, alarms and constraints and restrictions, uh, it gives us joy to be able to embrace life and live it and to see other people that are doing that. And I really do think one of the things we can do as a Christian witness right now is live life to the full. I'm not saying throw your mask away and get in somebody's face and stop social... No, not at all. But... Whatever ways you can do it, live life to the full. Keep going. Embrace. Enjoy. Uh, I got a text from that friend that, that was the best of all after this person went skydiving that said this, floating around at 14,000 feet, seeing God's creation from that angle was one of the most dramatic things I have ever seen. You must take Lori and do this. Well, I talked to Lori about that, and I, I have a prayer request today. <laughs> no, here's the reality. I don't know if I'll ever get Lori or myself uh, to strap on a parachute at 14,000 feet. But I will tell you this. I hope that Lori and I and you can live life to the full, can embrace the opportunities we have to enjoy our lives because you know what? There's going to come a time when you can't. We're going to talk about that today. This is the, the theme of the sermon today from Ecclesiastes chapter 6. If you have a Bible, turn there. The message is simply this. Brothers and sisters, enjoy your life while you can. I'd like to read Ecclesiastes 6 together. This is God's word. Listen. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth possessions and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it is not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. 
For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Well, not surprisingly, if you've been paying attention to these messages from Ecclesiastes, our message today is once again about vanity, vanity, vapor, vapor. So what is the vanity du jour in chapter 6? What is the vanity we find this time? Well, I'm going to describe it as what what I might call God's giving dilemma. And what I mean by that is that sometimes the Lord gives some things and sometimes he doesn't give others. And we don't understand how it is that he decides who gets what. Sometimes the Lord, according to the preacher in Ecclesiastes, gives someone wealth, possessions, and honor so that they don't lack anything out of everything that they desire. But then what? The Lord does not give that person the power to enjoy those things. This is the case that has confounded the preacher's heart this week, that he says this lies heavy on mankind. Have you ever questioned why the Lord gives some things to some people and doesn't give some things to others. Uh, My wife, Lori, is a speech therapist. And in Indiana, she worked for this government program where she would go to homes to do speech therapy for pre-K kids, little kids. And so she got to see all kinds of different uh, lives of, of the people in our community. And sometimes Lori would come home and she would say, you know what, I hope someday I get to ask God why... Some couples that are Christians that, you know, love the Lord would be wonderful parents, try and try and try and can't have kids. And she said, but I go into some homes and I come across the worst parents you could imagine and they have one kid after another. She said, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. Have you ever wondered about these kind of things? Why does the Lord give some things to some people and he doesn't give some things to others? It is a dilemma. And the preacher said it weighs heavy on his heart. He said it's so bad that it would be better off for a person to never be born at all than to have to wrestle with this vanity, with this dilemma. It's interesting. The preacher describes a case where a person is given all of these things that they desire but can't enjoy them. And it says a stranger enjoys them instead. We don't know why. It could be that this person uh, accumulated much things and then died without an heir. Or maybe they accumulated a lot of stuff, but their relationship with their children had gone bad. That happens, doesn't it? And there was no heir. Maybe this person suffered the loss of their, their wealth and possessions in war. That was not an unusual thing during this time. Or maybe they were the victim of violence or injustice and someone took by force their things. Maybe there was a bad economy. Maybe they made bad decisions. On and on and on we could go. Whatever the case, it sure bothers the preacher to see that sometimes God gives some things and sometimes he withholds things. And so he says that it would be better for that person never to be born because then they wouldn't have to deal with these evils, this vanity, this futility. He says that the person that's never born would at least have rest. And it would be better than living 1,000 years twice over yet not enjoying the good. Well, this leads us to another dilemma of the things that God gives. Because the reality is no one lives 1,000 years twice over, at least not in these bodies on this earth, do they? 
And this leads us to another, uh, another struggle that we have, and that is that sometimes God may give someone the power to enjoy life's good things, but he doesn't give them time. Have you ever seen that in life? The ability to enjoy the many blessings someone has been given cut short? Absolutely, this happens all the time. In verse 11, he says, For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. The preacher says, sometimes the problem is there aren't enough days to enjoy it anyway. And you know, it's funny, it really doesn't matter how long a person lives. It seems like in the end, it always seemed too short. You know, have you noticed that? You might lose a loved one at, at 100 years old, but you'll always wish there had been more time. John Claypool uh, shared about this burden in his own life, and he wrote in one of his books that all grief comes back to this one thing. We run out of time. It is the source of our grief. One of the most painful experiences I've had as a pastor, and I remember it so vividly, it was in Indiana, one night we were at home, there was a knock on the door, and one of my neighbors came to the door and he said, Eric, uh, one of our church members, he's had a heart attack, you need to get to the hospital right away. This was a man who was pretty young, he was in his 50s, he lived just a few blocks from me, so I got dressed, I got in the car and went to the hospital and I sat with his wife, and we didn't know what was happening, and a, a doctor came out and I was there when he came out and very, his bedside manner was lacking, very curtly he explained, your husband had a very serious cardiac event, we did everything that we could, but unfortunately we weren't able to save him and your husband has expired, do you have any questions? That was about the way he said it. And worse than that was sitting there beside her when she had to call her daughter who was in college in another state and tell her, your dad ran out of time. It was one of the saddest moments I have experienced. There's just not enough time. And I'll tell you what's interesting. That family, this husband that died, was very successful. They enjoyed lots of things in life. But I know that they would have traded everything they had for more time. But you can't. Do you notice in this, this, uh, in this chapter, one of the things that is frustrating for the preacher is he says that we aren't strong enough to, to wrestle with the one who's stronger than we are, right? Who is that? God. Who appoints the number of our days? God. And there is no amount of arm twisting that we can do, no amount of pleading or bargaining that can change God's mind when he says, thus saith the Lord. So here is the hard reality of Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Listen to me. God doesn't offer any of you or me any promises that, that the blessings I have today I'm going to have tomorrow. And he doesn't even promise a tomorrow. How do you feel? Encouraged? Let's close in prayer. Well, fortunately, this is not the end. So what should we do if we, we realize, look, the blessings I've got today might not last into tomorrow, and I might not even be here tomorrow. Well, let me suggest what you ought to do is enjoy it while you can. This is not an unspiritual piece of advice. Enjoy your life while you can. Count every blessing God has given you today and give Him thanks. And make the most of them. Make today count while you've got a chance. Now, last week, we talked about contentment, right? You remember that? And here's my word for contentment, enough. Contentment says, Lord, what you've given me today is enough. I'm satisfied. Thank you. But what we're talking about today is the next step. It is fulfillment, right? Contentment says, God, you've given me enough. I am grateful. Thank you. Fulfillment says, Lord, now teach me to take these blessings you've given me and to make the most of them. It's one thing to receive a gift. It's another thing to make it count, to know what to do with it. So I want you to be content, and I want to be content, but I want you to be fulfilled, and I want to be fulfilled. I'll tell you, there was a time in, in mine and Lori's life, we, we got married and we were newlyweds, and we had this apartment, I think it was built in the 1940s, little apartment, and contentment said, Lord, thank you for this little old apartment. 
It's enough. We're satisfied. Now, fulfillment said, all right, Lord, now uh, on New Year's Eve, how many of our friends can we fit into this apartment so that we can take out the fine china and celebrate Y2K in style? Anybody remember Y2K? Do you remember what you did on Y2K? I'll tell you what we did. We used our fine china the only time we've ever used it. We, we got the fine china out, and we had about a dozen of our friends into our old little dinky apartment to ring in Y2K, and I still remember it to this day. Do you see the difference between contentment and fulfillment? You can be satisfied but fail to make the most of what God has given you. Let me say this. Contentment will say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. You've given me everything I need. But fulfillment will say, thank you for saving me, Lord. Now lead the way and show me how to live my life for you. Lord, thank you for saving me. Now teach me how to share this salvation with other people. Because, Lord, if you've been this good to me, surely it will bring me joy for, for you to be good to other people. Use me, Lord. Here I am. Send me. Right? There's a difference between contentment and fulfillment. So let's think for a moment. What holds us back from making the most of today? From using the blessings God gives us right now to the full. Well, number one, laziness. Can I tell you, some of us need to confront laziness in our lives. Sometimes it's easier just to be content than it is to be fulfilled. I have a good friend who lives in another state, and I've tried to get this friend to come visit us several times since we moved to Georgia. I've talked to him, and I said, you need to come visit us. You, you've got time. Chattanooga is a beautiful city. Ringgold's a neat town. There's so much stuff to see and do. It's beautiful. Come visit. You know what he always says? Uh, I don't really like to travel. I love my friend, but I want to kick him in the pants and say, stop being content, being lazy. There's a big world out there. Enjoy it. God has given you blessings and time. Use it. Come on. And I know the Lord says this to me. I'm, I'm preaching to myself here too. Sometimes I think what holds us back from making the most of today is fear. Amen? All right, let me ask you this. How many of you would go skydiving if it didn't involve any risks and you could see the earth from 14,000 feet and behold God's glory? Absolutely. How many of you aren't going to do it because it involves risk, right? Look, the reality is embracing life involves risk and some of us choose to be safe rather than fulfilled. Shame on us. And this is a big one for me. I remember years ago, I was with a bunch of my friends when I was single. They were my church friends. And somebody got the oddball idea. I don't remember where we were, what we're doing. They said, hey, let's all do a trust fall. You know what that is? That's where you, you get up on something like a table and you just fall backwards and you trust your friends to catch you. Nobody had been drinking, by the way. Right? This was about 10, 10 of my friends from church. So one by one, one of my friends got up on this table and fell back and we caught him. And you know what happened when they got to me? I said, no thanks. I'm not going to do it. Because in my mind, I started running through all the what ifs. What if they aren't ready? What if they're not as strong as I am? What if I weigh more than they do? And I just declined. And they, they tried and tried and I would not do it because I was afraid. You know what? I was vindicated slightly. My son, James, he went to a church camp, and they did a trust fall, and they didn't catch him. I'm sorry, James. That's, that's a traumatic. We're still working that out. Do you remember that? In Indiana, the, the, at church camp, they didn't catch him during the trust fall. But that's okay. Life involves risks. At least he tried. I was too afraid to do it. Sometimes we let our fear hold us back. And if we live just going over all of the what ifs, we will never find fulfillment in life. For some of us, it is the pride of procrastination. Okay? For some of us, it's, well, I'll do that. That would be wonderful. I'll do that tomorrow. Or I'll do that next month. Or we'll plan to do that next year. Or we'll do that when we've saved up enough money or something like that. But let me tell you, there's a lot of pride when you start procrastinating because you are presuming to have a tomorrow when God has not guaranteed it. The book of James addresses this very clearly. 
James says, those of you that say, well, today we're going to do this, tomorrow we're going to go into that town and do business and make a profit and make all these grand plans. He says, how do you know what you're going to do tomorrow? You may not even be here. What you need to say is, if the Lord is willing, we will do these things. Brothers and sisters, there is some pride in procrastinating. And when we put life off until tomorrow or next month or next year, we may not find that we have next month or next year or tomorrow. And then for some of us, it is the sin of, of bad priorities. The writer of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, addresses this over and over. People who work and work and work to get more stuff, right? He says, but in the end, they didn't have life at all. It wasn't fulfilling at all. They're never satisfied. Nothing is ever enough. It's because they've got the wrong priorities. They think more wealth, more possessions is going to bring the joy. But it does. it's one thing to have it. It's another thing to put it to use. Jesus told a parable that really kind of sums this up for us. It was in Luke chapter 12. Sometimes it's called the parable of the rich fool. So if you don't want to be a fool, listen to this parable. I'll read you part of it. Jesus said, One's life does not consist in an abundance of his possessions. He told a story and said, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And the rich man thought to himself, What should I do? For I have nowhere to store all of my crops. And so he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And then I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? Well, the preacher says a stranger is going to end up getting them. And Jesus went on to say, So is the one who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Brothers and sisters, understand this first and foremost. Jesus said, what good does it do someone to gain the whole world, to get all the possessions, all the wealth, all the things in the world, but forfeit your soul? So let me tell you something. You will not enjoy that fate. Joy begins with being rich toward God. It begins with God himself and receiving the most important gift you could ever get, which is Jesus Christ. Placing your trust in him, asking his forgiveness, asking him to break the shackles and bonds that will keep you forever from enjoying anything in life and into eternity till you have peace with God through the forgiveness of Jesus who gave himself for you to wash your sins away so that the slate could be clean and you could really know what joy is. Then what you do is you start with contentment. And you say, God, thank you for what you've given me today. It's enough. I don't need anything more. But then you move on to fulfillment. And you say, now, Lord, with these things that you've given me, that is enough. How can I make the most of it. How can I enjoy it while I have the ability? How can I enjoy it while I have the time? And how can I do it in a way that honors you? Brothers and sisters, living lives of laziness and fear and procrastination and idolatry doesn't honor God and it does not fulfill your soul. So my question today is this. Number one, are you content? I hope so. But are you settled into just contentment? Are you satisfied just being content? Or do you realize that Jesus really meant it when he said, I have said these things so that you may have joy and that your joy might be full. Let us ask God to help us to understand how to enjoy life while we can. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you. We thank you that you are the creator of life, the giver of life, the creator of joy, joy itself, and the giver of joy. Lord, I am grateful today that every single one of us in this room, no matter what difficulties we face, still have the choice today to make the most of our lives with what we have while we have time and ability to do it. Lord, don't let us miss this day. Father, I pray today that we would reject laziness, that, Father, we would have a greater motivation than safety when our fears rear their ugly heads. 
I pray, Father, that you would help us to uh, set aside the foolish pride of procrastination that says, I'll always have time later. I'll do it tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you will forgive us for our idolatry where we have tried to find fulfillment in things that can't deliver. But Lord, you have given us all that we need. We have enough today to be fulfilled. We thank you, Lord, you've given us Jesus who paid it all, who is our all in all, and Lord, who now lives and reigns with us and in us, and who says, I have come that you may have joy and that that joy may be complete. Lord, we pray that this promise will be fulfilled today that, Lord, we would have joy today. Father, that we would enjoy life today because we may not have tomorrow. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.